Well, here we are. When I woke up and actually saw the ocean this morning, I was like, really? That's been out there the whole time. I mean, that's kind of how it is sometimes with the Lord. You know, with the things of our lives, there, there's a, 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 a the word occlusion comes to my mind. I don't know if that's the correct word or not, but, uh, you know, it's obstructed. You can't see. Uh, you've heard that it might be there. Uh, other people seem to have great vision and experience and even come back with sand on their feet. Um, and actually all over them with a, with a wind. Um, but but you, you just couldn't see it, you know. And then one day, this is very important, your eyes were opened. Now, if you're a grammarian, we'll have a little sidestep here. Their eyes were opened, your eyes were opened. That's in passive tense. That means you didn't do anything to open your eyes. You just were there. You had eyes. And then they were opened. And that is the way the word describes what Jesus does for us. He opens our eyes. He opens our hearts. So part of it is that we do ask. Once we recognize we need to ask. That comes from God too. So, you know, as we look at at our last time together here, I'm surprised that you aren't at the beach. I really, when I saw that, I thought we're going to have four people there. The worship team, (laughs) me, I'm not even sure about the party room. Uh, I hear y'all saw my bangs last night, so (laughs) it was a short ladder. I couldn't get up there high enough. But they said, my bangs look good. That was good. Some consolation. But but as I I was in the Word this morning, and and I was just like, um, Lord, whatever. What what is it um, you want? And, And you played my Jesus, I love thee. That's one of my favorite. One of my favorite, all-time favorites. We did that. I had, on. I do have a music CD. It's called Pretty Good Music. <laughs> it's not great music. It's just pretty good. And on that Pretty Good Music CD, I took the, the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee, and I added something to it. And actually, we had just cut it and had my my producer sent it to us when mama died in January of 99. That's what we played at her funeral. And um, it it just takes on a whole new perspective when you uh, begin to look at death. And um, in mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with a glittering. Crown on my brow. And then the, the verse before that, I'll sing, With a death dew lies cold on my brow, is right before that. And what I want to sort of look at this morning is that you don't get to the glittering crown unless you have the death, the crown on the brow that has died. And... I had some, God does this sometimes, I I had something prepared, and um, it was good, it really was good. (laughs) So we'll just uh, go on a little journey this morning. But one thing that I was thinking as I was looking out my window and trying to paint the ocean, you know, and looking at that, and looking at this, and looking at that, actually what I painted last year, I I found it in my suitcase, and um, it was one of those hidden pockets. I'm like, whoa, look at this. And, and I pulled it out, and it's actually good. I mean, it, it, it looks like what it kind of looks like out m- my window. I'm like, a year later, I'm like, who would thought? I, why can't I do that now? And, um, and I think as I looked at that, I thought, you know, sometimes I look at how Jesus loves. And I think, uh, my, mine doesn't look like that. Um, you know, how do I get that? in my life 
And, and, and it's the Lord that says, just keep, keep working on it. Just keep moving in that direction. And, and that's how God begins to transform us. Um, I became a Christian when I was five years old. My dad was a Baptist preacher, and so I was in church every moment of life, my life, I think, except conception. That's just how preacher's kids are. You're just there all the time. <laughs> and uh, especially if it's small Southern Baptist churches, you know, they hire the family. Uh, <laughs> they don't pay much, but they hire the whole crew. And so, um, you know, I was in church, and so I heard all the sermons. You know, I heard, I heard the stories. And, and, and one night, I, I, it was Moses or Abraham, I don't know. And... Um, I, I didn't play out front afterwards on Sunday night, and I went across the driveway to the pastorium because they always have the pastor's house closed so they can see, you know, what you're up to. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I went over there, and Mama saw me going home, and she followed me, and she said, Are you sick? And I said, No, I want to ask Jesus into my heart as my Savior. And she said, Well, let's wait on your father. I, I wish she hadn't have done that, but, you know, he was the preacher. So... <laughs> You know, he came in, and she explained what I had wanted, and, and he explained evidently to me again, and then told me to go in my bedroom and think about it. And Mother was so funny. She said, I went into my bedroom and basically turned around and came back out, and I said, I've thought about it. <laughs> and and um, I want to ask Jesus, am I five years old? Yeah, I've thought about it, yeah. Pretty sure. So I don't really remember the prayer. I don't remember what happened. But I remember afterwards, Mother and I, she was getting me ready for bed. And I was putting my little footed pajamas on, uh, which I, we always had a cut because I had to have my feet out of them. You know, they started in and then they came out, you know. Uh, not quite like your experience last night. but um, But you just never know what happens when you're asleep. See, I do listen when you talk. <laughs> but we were crying, my mother and I. And, 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 uh, and I said, why, why are we crying? And she said, because we're so happy. <laughs> and I started getting confused right then. I'm like, okay, something strange about this. And so I went through my youth. I went to Sanford University, um, a Baptist college in Birmingham, Alabama, academic excellence in a Christian environment. Um, they locked us up at night, basically. <laughs> and um, I, I just, you know, and I was plagued with depression my whole life. And it, it would be really like a dark cloud would come in, and I would just be drowning, and I couldn't, I couldn't get out of it. And, and it, was, it was just desperation a lot of times. But... Um, I graduated, and I got a job teaching seventh grade English. I don't know how that happened. Um, actually, I had interviewed with this man, and um, he lost my phone number, but somehow he got my parents' unlisted phone number in Pensacola and called them and told them that they, he wanted to offer me a job and ask for my phone number. So when he called me, I couldn't refuse because my parents already knew that I had a job <laughs> offer. You know, I would have said, no, I don't think so. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And um, so in that year of just whatever, you know, beginning to learn about life, you know, when you start having to earn your first paycheck and realize that things cost stuff, you know, like rent and, and insurance and everything, um, I just... In the mornings, I lived in the basement of a, of a friend's parents' house, and, and uh, I would on Sunday morning I would turn on the television, and, and there would be Robert Schuler in the Crystal Cathedral. And at some point in that, that presentation, they would play hymns and show pretty scenes. And my heart would just be stirred by those hymns because that's what we sang, you know, in my church. And so I had a yearning. And so I met a girl who taught Bible study, and she wasn't like a Christian, you know, like undercover Christian. I was like, I'm a Christian, but don't tell anybody, you know. You don't want to be overt, 
in your Christianity, and she was just like all over it. You know, we'd go into a restaurant, and she'd say, are you interested in spiritual things to the waitress? And I'd be like, I'm so sorry. I would like the meatloaf, please. <laughs> but I began to realize that people would respond. And I promise you, I mean, she called the turkey talk line on, at Thanksgiving. And um, as she's talking to the turkey talk line lady, she said, Hey, are you interested in spiritual things? And this is what the woman said. Just this morning, I got down on my knees and I said, God, if you're real, I pray that you would give me a sign today. The turkey talk line. Lady, you know what I'm saying? It's this. This is this is who. This is what we're talking about here. We're not talking about like stuck in the mud. You know, we we we're talking mystical, mysterious. Are you willing to get on the train and ride? You can stay in the station, and one day you're going to wind up in heaven. But you're going to miss the lot. You're going to miss a lot, and your 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 sorrows and you're crushing you're not going to have the bomb of Gilead you're not going to understand how God through Jesus ministers to you and in the in between times of what happens you know it's just excruciating yes but we want to understand what it means to patiently wait you have to learn about patience it's just not something I don't think you're born with the kids have you how many of you have had to teach your children about you're just too patient No. So I heard a girl telling, the same girl telling another, st- another girl in, in an apartment. I was going to go out to supper with this lady, this Bible teacher. And she was, it was a small apartment, so I could hear her talking to this girl. And she was telling her about the last chapter of a book by a woman named Corey Tinboom, And it was called The Hiding Place. And she said, in this last chapter of this book, Corey had been in a concentration camp. And she had been released on a clerical error two weeks before all the women in her age division were exterminated. And that God allowed her to tell people her story. That her sister Betsy had said to her, Corey, people will listen to us because we've been in hell. And we will tell them that no pit is so deep that God is not deeper still. So if you're not in the pit, it's very difficult to tell folks that God is there. It's really easy to say, hey, he's here in the hoo-hoo times. But, you know, in the place where you're eating dirt, you know, somewhere in there you're like, you know, God is still here. (laughs) Spitting out the dirt. So she starts telling this story. And she said, you know, Corey went back to Germany and she'd spoken to, you know, uh, to a crowd and she told them about God's love and everything God had shown her. And afterwards, an ex prison guard came up to her who had become a Christian since the end of the war and told her, you know, she recognized who he was and told her that, you know, he had become a Christian and some about God's grace covers us all, doesn't it? And he stuck his hand out. And she said, I couldn't take his hand. He had beaten my sister. Her sister died in the concentration camp. And um, I was in the next room and I began to sweat because I understood what it meant to be abused. And I couldn't even comprehend that, you know, situation where, you know, come back and abuse her. You know, I'm, I'm free. I'm covered. I'm, God has given me a new life. And so let's just, you know, call it even. That's hard, isn't it? When our hearts are... No, I'm I'm going to hurt you. Let me get my gun. I'll be right back. <laughs> and I'm being facetious about it, but no, that's a rage. We're, we're talking, some of you may never experience this, but we're talking, you know, a, a, a wild, untamable force that you can't take care of. And so this is what she prayed. She said, Lord, if you want me to take his hand and whatever, you're going to have to do it through me. And I never really heard it like that. I'd heard we're vessels of God, but I'd never really heard, you know, what she's about to say. And so she kept praying. She prayed again. And finally, she said she felt warmth come through her head, which Baptists, we don't have that. You know, I didn't, I didn't understood, so I wasn't quite sure, but I believed that this was true. She felt warmth come through her head, down her arm, and she was not flooded with forgiveness. She was flooded with love. See, that 
that was an important, those of you taking notes, one or two of you, it, it was love that brought in forgiveness. That's what it is for us. We are drawn to his love. Kindness draws us to repentance. And so she took his hand and said, yes, brother, he does. And my, this lady in the next room said she was reading the book, driving. And as she was going down the road, she saw this concrete pipe section. They were doing stuff on the road. And she said, you know what? We're just like concrete pipes. God just made us like concrete pipes. We, we can't manufacture ourselves. We can't put us where we're supposed to be. We can't manufacture what goes through us. We can't cap up what goes through us. We can't even clean our our pipes out. We have to, First John 1, 9, confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Road a rooter that pipe out and clean that pipe so it's clean and available. So God is what does the stuff through you. It is not your manufacturing love and forgiveness and ability and whatever. He does it through me. Okay, I'm in the next room, been a Christian since I was five, been in church all the time and I'm just there to go to supper with this girl in there telling the story and this is me. A concrete pipe. I used to play. This is God. He knows you. I used to play in a concrete pipe when I was a kid. And so I didn't have to like, wonder what that's like. No, I was like, and I thought, I can be a concrete pipe. Lord, if it's you through me, boom. Yeah. And the girl who she was telling it to didn't get it. She was like, that's a good story. Thanks for telling me. She goes out and the girl goes, I'm like, a concrete pipe. Whoa. A a concrete pipe. And as I've told that story, women have come up and said, well, can I be a lapis pipe or a, you know, a, a emerald pipe? And I'm like, lady, you can be any kind of pipe you want. But me, I'm... Put it on the ground where we can all eat. I am a concrete pipe. (laughs) And that is what God used to flip that switch, to open my eyes. To, it is him. He does this. We're the frail. We're the brokenness. We're we're the feet of clay. We're the ones who don't get it right. We're the ones who, till the day we die, I have to say, I'm really sorry. You know, I hate it when somebody goes, I I didn't mean to hurt you. I really think we need to change that. I absolutely meant to hurt you badly. (laughs) I said that. No, it wasn't in jest. I just, I was serious. I'm so sorry. I need a savior. It, It is amazing to think about what God, as I look at the beach and I look at my painting, one day I will be like Jesus. So as I was thinking about what we're telling this morning, we are in Luke. That's, thank you, Lord. We're in the same book. And in Luke, Luke chapter 23... <clears throat> At the crucifixion, Luke 23, basically, you can go down to 49, those of you who are A personalities. You know, A personalities are funny. A personalities are there with their pen and their paper, and they're ready. And they're like, I've got no notes. <laughs> but they got that. B personalities are like, I was supposed to bring paper. <laughs> and we say to the A's, can I borrow some paper? And the A's are like, no, it's a bound notebook. <laughs> and we're like, oh, okay, I think I got a, something in my purse somewhere. You know, like a little gum thing. I can use this. And then I'm like, I don't got a pen. I, I need a pen. And I say to my friend, hey, may I borrow a pen? They're like, no, this is my writing instrument. It's my favorite one. I might have like a freebie someone gave me. I don't know if it works or not. And the bees are just happy as they can be. <laughs> Thank you. And the A's are like, you're just disgusting. <laughs> you will never run the world. <laughs> and the bees are like, yeah, baby, it rain on. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> it's 
how you're wired. God did that to you. Don't feel badly about it. And, and if you're an A, we need you. I mean, without the A's, we would all be wandering around with, with no paper or writing utensils. <laughs> I mean, somebody's got to be in charge like that. I'm just so sorry. It just comes. I don't plan it. Now, don't forget to go by the bookstore (laughs) and buy up the rest of those paintings I brought. So you can go, there is a beginning. (laughs) But sign up for the the conference CDs. They do do sell those there. (laughs) You are not. Or don't. I'm not buying that. Uh Uh-uh. So here we come to, to Luke 23, and it's the crucifixion. And, and just so you'll get the reference for it, for those of you who, you know, like to know what's going on. Um, right in your notes, write chapter, Luke chapter 8, because that's where you really get an explanation about the ministering women, the ones who came out of Galilee. Those are the ones who left everything to follow Jesus. And don't forget that at that time, those women were not supposed to be doing that. So at that time, for women to be following with a group of men, you have to really understand what everyone thought they were actually doing for those men. So they gave up reputation, lives, anything that might come after that for Jesus. We were all in. And so when, when you get down to he's crucified, and verse 49, it said, And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee, they're always in that group, I love it. They never get all their names, but they're like, you know, the ones who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. And then Joseph comes and he gets the body and he he prepares it. He puts the linen cloth and, and he puts it into a tomb that has never been used. And in verse 55, and it said, Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee followed after and saw the tomb, how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared those spices and perfumes, that hundred pounds. That's a lot of cinnamon. That's a lot of grinding. That's a lot of preparation. After after they have had their hopes and dreams nailed to a tree and put in a tomb with the rock rolled closed. And then the next day was the Sabbath, and they rested according to the commandment. In, in my Bible, I wrote to myself, when these things happen and you are mired up in in whatever's going on you just try to do the next right thing okay you know like people how do we live you just try to do the next right thing and so it comes to the first day of the week at early dawn they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared now probably somewhere in the archives of this place you will find a teaching that I give on this particular passage that I'm not going to do today. But it said, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. I'm sorry, I just have to do here a moment. Can you imagine your friends, y'all go to the tomb, and there's, you know, the one who's in charge. She's the A, the one that's the B. There's the one who always gets lost. You could tie her car to your car with a rope, and she would not get there. Uh, She would be lost. You know, there's the flirty one. You you know, there's the, you know, if you don't grab this one, she's going to wander off and look at something. (laughs) Well, here they get to the tomb, and they really knew that was the tomb. That was where he was. And the stove was, and and can you imagine, I mean, it said, what does it say in that verse? It said, and they entered. They went in the tomb. I mean, can you see one come in, you know? Do you see him? I don't know. He's not, I can't find him. Well, are you looking? Well, yeah, there's just not a whole lot in here. I, I mean, you know, they're... Per- and then can you see the A personality? I'm, look, myself. You know, they go in there. And they're like, no, no, she's right. There's no... Ba- and 
And, and, and so I love the next one in the New American Standard. And it happened while they were perplexed about this. <laughs> Behold. Behold. Two shiny men came. These shiny men were standing there. It said these men in dazzling apparel. Shiny men showed up. I just wrote in my Bible, they were not expecting shiny men at the tomb of their lost hopes and dreams. Shiny men. Can you imagine you and your friends? Those are shiny men. (laughs) And the women were terrified, really. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you very much. And bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, here's the great question. We've been asking questions. Jesus had Martha a question. Here he, the the shiny man asked the ladies, why do you seek the living one among the dead? And you and I need to look, allow the Lord to show us where are we seeking the living one among the dead things of our lives? What has become a hindrance to you? And you're not going to find Jesus there in that relationship. Some of you worship your children. I'm telling you, one day they're probably going to leave home. And then someone will say, yeah, but they come back. (laughs) You're not going to find your life in your children. It is a job. It's what God calls you to do to a time. And I had a friend call and she said, I need you to write something for women whose kids have now gone off to college and they have no idea what to do themselves. What they have done for, you know, 22 years is over. I mean, you know, that's a long time. And they don't, you know, what do I do now? Well, God has something for you. And they say to him, he is not here. <laughs> Can you hear the A personality? Tell us something we don't know. We, we've already gone and looked. <laughs> he is not here. But he has risen. The next word is very important. Remember. How he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. This is before they came out. Go back to the beginning. Remember what he said, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. And verse 8, I think I want this on my tombstone. And they remembered his words. I've said this before. I really want an interactive tombstone. (laughs) You know, so when someone approaches, they cross a beam and I pop up on this screen and I say hey welcome you can leave a message I won't get it because I'm not here if you died today do you know where you'd spend eternity that's really a very important question You may have to work up to it in your relationships. That's probably not your lead off one. (laughs) But, you know, who? who, anyway. And they remembered his words. And look what they did. And they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It reminded me of a poem. Prior to their seeing, talking to the shiny man, uh, it reminded me of a poem by Judith Vorst. From, from a little collection called If I Were in Charge of the World and Other Worries. It's an excellent, excellent book. And there's a poem in there called Mending. And it says, A giant hand inside my chest stretches out and takes my heart within its mighty grasp and squeezes until it breaks. A gentle hand inside my chest with mending tape and glue patches up my heart until it's almost good as new. I ought to know by now that broken hearts will heal again. But while I wait for glue and tape, the pain, the pain, the pain. Those women came to the tomb with broken hearts. They left with a new mission. And what they were to tell was, he is risen. They did not believe them. Don't be discouraged if in what you're about, you don't seem to get the result that you hope for. 
because it's really not your job. People's eyes and hearts must be opened by God. But it's really important that you have come to the tomb of your broken dreams and hopes and found that he's risen. And that shiny men say, he's not here. Remember the words he told you. If you don't know the word, it's difficult for you to remember what you don't know. You have to remember that what you've already received. And so they got up and they they went and Peter ran and, and then it says in verse 12 that he went home after it happened. And then the, behold, verse 13, two of them were going. That means two of the ones who were in the upper room waiting for Jesus to come back. It's the third day. And they only heard that the women had seen him and that Peter corroborated that he wasn't in the tomb. And so here are two losers going home. <laughs> they asked me today what the topic of my 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 thing is. It'd be hard to put a topic on what I've been doing but I wanted to say Jesus Jesus loves losers I had a whole series called that a lot of people didn't come because they didn't think they were losers I had, I had another one called the desperate women tour some people didn't come because they didn't think they were desperate I'm like I'm not talking about you I'm talking about these people in the Bible And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. If you remember John 11, how far was where Jesus was, or Bethany from Jerusalem? Little, little trivia. Two miles. You can go back and look. Not now. And they were conversing with each other about all the things that had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and been, began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Some of us are on our road of grief and broken hopes and dreams. And Jesus is walking along beside us, but we've just not been able to see him because for some reason our eyes are prevented from seeing that. There's a process we need to go through. But this is one of the funniest stories of the entire Bible because these two guys are going and they're walking and they're discussing and this stranger just comes up and just starts walking with them. Can you see him? Like, do you know him? Oh. <laughs> nope, never seen him. Hey, how you doing? Go find your own people to walk with. <laughs> And they're trying to suss out. It's so important that you have a friend who's in a spiritual place as you are so you can discuss things. It's difficult to talk. If you're in a certain spiritual place that you talk to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, it's difficult to get information back and forth. You really need someone in the same water level as you or a little more so you can sort of have some good input. And while they were discussing these things, here Jesus comes and he said, what are the words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? I mean, he like gets right into the heart of it. What are y'all talking about? And I love it. It's like they, they stood still looking sad. You know, it's almost like a third grade boy play. And look what they say. And one of them named Cleopas. Now, they're two men, but we only get one's name. It's got guys. They don't get all the, ta- the de- details. But I have a feeling that the reason that we get Cleopas's name because of what he asked. It probably is the most ridiculous question in all the Bible. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? <laughs> Basically what he says, man, where have you been? In a hole in the ground? I mean, how? Uh, and he's like, no, really, it's a cave. Really, It was a... On a hole in the ground. I mean, basically, you know what's funny about this question? Jesus really is the only one who actually knew what was going on in Jerusalem. And Cleopas, we get his name because he asked the question, Hey, man, are you the only one in the entire stinking world who doesn't know what went on? And this is the risen Christ. He's not even appeared to the disciples. He doesn't do that till after this story. So he goes to two losers, two quitters, two lost their hopes and going home. 
He goes and finds them in their desperation. You need to know that Jesus knows where you are. So you don't need to look around and go, he's not here. You need to say, where are you? I know that you're here. I believe that you're here, even though I don't believe you're here, my friend's prayer. Until you began to see, putting that word in your heart. And and I love what he says. He said, what things? <laughs> I would have said, I would have all of a sudden let him see me in all my glory. My robe. <laughs> I'd have like, <laughs> you know, I'd have like puffed up and, you know, like, ooh, you know. <laughs> I would have said before I kill both of you. (laughs) I'm the risen Christ. (laughs) Who has conquered hell and death. Cleopas. You need to read the words in red. You need to look at how Jesus deals with stuff. What does he say? It is priceless. What things? <laughs> I wouldn't have done that. Obviously. You need to keep looking at the ocean. You don't do it yet. You need to keep gazing at his love. What things? Because what he was doing was, he was saying to those men, tell me what's on your heart. Sometimes when we listen to people, we need to shut up and listen. What things? Well, they begin to say, well, you know, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed, and, in the, and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the, they, they call him a prophet here. Don't forget that, uh, prophet. And, and, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. Verse 21 in the New American Standard, and I've, I've put this in here, I have boxed, but we were hoping. But we were hoping, once again those expectations, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things have happened. Remember Jesus walking along beside him and listening and i love this one but also some women among us amazed us imagine that (laughs) when they were at the tomb early in the morning obviously you guys were not there why because y'all y'all were hiding in the upper room we're not going to say anything about that right now but the boys were hiding in the upper room while the women went to the tomb they could have been killed And they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen shiny men. Who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with them went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women also had said. But him they did not see. This is important. Until you see Jesus yourself, someone else's stories will only aid you. You got to see him for yourself. He is the risen Christ. And that doesn't mean I've seen, you know, like with my eyes. But it's the eyes of my heart. He opens that and I'm like, boom. And he said, and he he does call them, Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter in all his glory? It's very important to note here that Christ himself, Jesus himself said, He had to suffer and endure these things to enter into the glory and he taught them then Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem so they had a walk that they had time you know you you think about how long would it take you to walk seven miles some people say you know good shoes and a holiday in that's what it would take I mean I would need a break you know Seven miles they had, and this stranger is just talking to them, explaining to them. Look what it says. What, beginning with Moses, at the very beginning, and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And one thing when I was rereading it this morning, I felt like the Lord said, Roseanne, you need to go back with Moses, and you need to go all the way through, through all the prophets, and make sure you remember. You know. It's, it's in, within your realm of knowing. 
And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as if he would go farther. I mean, the risen Son of God did not even put themselves on what Hebrew Israelites were supposed to do. It was basically a law. If you had a stranger at your gates at sundown, you were to invite them in your home because you may be entertaining an angel unaware. I mean, now we call the police if there's someone... (laughs) down there we don't go hey are you an angel come on up we're having the hamburger helper you know but no we're like but then they you know they invited and he what he act can you imagine he acts as if here he's going farther he's oh no i've got you know i got stuff to do i've been kind of busy the last three days you know been busy on about my no and they and they urged him saying stay with us for it's getting toward evening and the day is now nearly over and he wanted to stay with them and it came about that when he had reclined at table with them and he took the bread and blessed it and broke it now let's remember they're with the upper room crowd what had they seen Jesus do before the crucifixion the last supper he took the bread he broke it he blessed it he broke it and he gave it. And he began giving it to them. Verse 31. Do not despair. Your eyes will be opened. And then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And now he did the who do we. Shazam he vanished. <laughs> he waited till they recognized him. After they had been taught. After they had the opportunity to ask him in. To serve him. To, to say oh come on and be in with us. And gave him the guest of honor. And then he did that normal stuff that he had done. And it said their eyes were open. And boom, he vanished. Now what they said, very important. I would have been fainted. But they said to one another, they didn't go, Can you believe it? He just disappeared. What it says they said, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Although their eyes were prevented from seeing him, their hearts were responding to the word. The word, capital W, the word of God, explaining the word. Beginning with Moses. And what did they do now? It's it's evening, it's dark, and how many miles is it back to Jerusalem? Seven. So now they're on the road with robbers and bandits and dangers and, you know, no little flashlights they can carry with them. And they hurried back. Why? Just like the women at the tomb, when they realized that Jesus had risen, they went to tell the friends. And, and, and look what they say. These are losers. These, they're, they didn't stay. Can you see them? It's Cleopas and the and the other guy. <laughs> Let us in. Who's there? What's the password? Are you going to kill us? No, it's Cleopas and the other guy. Let us in. Let us in. They're in the upper room, you know. Let us in. Let us in. So it says they let him in. And they said, they arose that very hour, found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Do people recognize the Lord in your life by your service? to them you're a leader you're a servant we must say Lord may I be like my Savior help me to be humble in that service in my love may I be active in that so then you know Jesus doesn't wait for them to let him in he just comes through the door the who do we again? And while he, they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. <laughs> but they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. This happened to them once before when he was walking on the water. You know, in the, in the waves. I always love that. Fr- you know, they're like, ah, it's a ghost. I got, ah. And can you hear Jesus? Guys, guys, it's just me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Jesus, what are you doing walking on the water? <laughs> Sorry, I got a little nervous. And it says they were startled. Y'all, we're talking about 
supernatural stuff. It, it's spiritual stuff. I mean, healing and stuff I don't understand. But God does it. And, and just because I don't understand it doesn't mean he doesn't do it. Just because I think maybe he doesn't do it anymore doesn't mean he doesn't do it. I mean, I've seen him heal me. It's taken longer. It wasn't instantaneous. But there are some things that once it starts that, you know, the loaf starts rising. You know, if you ever make bread... You really need to let it rise, don't you? Oh, yeah. You don't let it rise. It's, it's like hockey pop. <laughs> I mean, you know, let it rise. And when it, you let it rise, and then the heat begins to make it what it's supposed to be, and you take it out, and it's the product, the fruit of that labor. And it says, and he said, I love this. Why are you troubled, and why do, you, why, why do doubts arise in your heart? What's wrong with you guys? See my hands and my feet, that it is I, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still, they couldn't believe it for joy. They were marveling. He said to them, you got, y'all got anything to eat? I just love Jesus. I mean, don't you just love him? Instead of like, let me tell you all some very important spiritual things now that I'm the risen Christ. He's like, what y'all got to eat? Any pimento cheese left? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And they weren't southern. It would have been fried. <laughs> and he took it and ate it in their sight. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. He's like, once again, remember that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets, and look here, and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Once again, look at verse 45. Circle this puppy. They, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, this, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, it's right there in the red, behold. I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you're to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Some of us have recognized that he's risen. But we've not been in that place where we've, we've been in the word. We've allowed that power to be clothed in the power of God. To walk in that. And he does all that. You know, it's not something you send off for in the mail. When I was little, you would do this box, you know, cereal box thing, and you would send it off, and you'd get stuff. Pretty pitiful, most of it, but, you know, you wanted to. It, he, this is what you're to do. If any of you came here wondering what you're supposed to be doing, he said, you are witnesses to this, and you're to go and tell people. Sometimes it's by your life. Sometimes I'm in Walmart. I mean, God shows me a lot about himself in Walmart. <laughs> I mean, you ever get to the line where it's like 10 or less and you're in a hurry and you got your two things and the lady in front of you has got 80,000 things on the thing and she can't find her stuff and she's wondering where's her glasses and she's wondering. And I just want to take her stuff and just start throwing it and, <laughs> and then go, okay, now you got 10. Don't worry, I'll help you out. <laughs> God began to say to me, do you ever wonder why you picked the longest line? Mm-hmm. I want you to look at the people around you and pray for them. Hmm. You mean like right, right while I'm standing in line? Okay. Get to the cash register. Janine has not had a good day. <laughs> She's throwing your stuff down the thing. Janine, how you doing? Fine. My supervisor, she just gets, I mean, it just starts coming out. My supervisor, she just gets on my nerve. I do the best I can, and she gets on my nerve. I said, well, what if I go tell her that you're doing a fine job? That would be wonderful. I said, okay, I'll go find her when I'm finished. I go to her, and I say, Janine just did an excellent job. This is her supervisor. Really? 
And I said, yeah, we had a great conversation. She backed my grocery. It, yeah, just want to come over and tell you. And Janine's watching. <laughs> so when I leave, I'm like, what happened? Janine and I have a connection. So when I go back, I look for Janine. You see, you have the opportunity in each moment, if you are open to the gospel, that you get to tell that he's alive, even if it's just by how kind you are. What does it say? The kindness of God leads us to repentance. Not pressuring somebody and say, you got to not dance, not smoke, not, not, you got to stop all that before. You got to have Jesus and that stuff begins to fall off. You don't get it together before. He went and found the losers, Cleopas, and the other guy. <laughs> I always imagine in heaven, the guy going up to Luke, you know, look, your name's on every page, Luke, 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 Luke. And I'm the other guy? But that's just my own pettiness. He didn't care. Why? Because Jesus came and found him and changed his stinking life. Oh, my goodness. There is hope. You may be standing at the tomb of your broken dreams and what God said to me this morning. I just want to share it with you. He said, Roseanne, you've been standing at the tomb of your broken dreams and life, career, everything. But I want you to know the shiny men are there. And they're saying he is risen. And it's time for you to do what I've asked you to do. And that's to tell the story. He is risen. He knows your name. He will come find you. Don't you worry. Wait patiently for him. Yes, wait patiently on the Lord. Because you will find yourself at the empty tomb. And he is risen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm just so grateful. Thank you that you met me at the empty tomb this morning. And I thank you for this platform. I thank you for the opportunity to speak well of your name. To say the truth. To be as transparent as I can. To encourage women to say, let us go forth. And say, he's risen. May we say, some of us need to come to the tomb. And we need to see that part of us that needs to die. To be crucified on the cross with you. And say take this from me. I want want to be like you. I want to be that concrete pipe that you flow through. Thank you for taking the burden off of me. For having to manufacture what Jesus is supposed to be through me. To manufacture forgiveness or love or patience or kindness or knowledge or wisdom or anything. He said, I will be in you. I'm the Christ, the risen Christ. So today, no matter if you're listening to this on the new app by Cannon Beach, you just go on your phone and look for the app. And, and, and the library of all the speakers and all the wisdom that has been given. Or if you're here today and you hear this new for the first time, your eyes have been opened, your heart has been opened, give that to Jesus. You know, you never know what they did with those spices they were going to use at the tomb. I bet that whole graveyard smelled like spice as they threw it up and threw it down because they didn't need that anymore because Jesus had risen. He didn't need anything they had. He wanted to give them himself. So, Father, I pray right now that this won't be the bubble. It will be the beginning of the stream. That it will flow down to one day we hit the ocean. And we will see Christ face to face. As we are known. Not through a glass darkly. But face to face.
I'm grateful, Lord. Thank you. If there's anybody here who maybe needs to give your heart to Jesus, you need to enter into that marriage com- contract with God. If you'll just raise your hand. Just raise your hand and keep it up. Anybody. I pray for those of us who are Cleopas and the other guy. We're on the road to Emmaus. We've lost hope. We haven't seen the evidence. I want you to know that Jesus is walking by you. And he's going to open your eyes. Because you're here today and the bell has been rung. You can't unring this bell of truth. He wanted you to hear the hope. The hope. The lifting. So leave the graveyard. Come out, Lazarus. Take the grave clothes off of him. Let him walk free. He is not here. He's risen. The shiny men say, go. And you go wherever God is calling you. And when you get burdened, you think about this moment. And you realize this is a living, breathing reality. Thank you, Jesus.